Cleo, you have been on a little bit of a world tour, culminating in the highlight coming to join us in person in our underground bunker. In rural Quebec? In rural Quebec. Um, I thought we were under the Empire State Building. It's both at the same time. Well, it's just really deep, so it's actually mm -hmm. got that intersection. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's deep, but at an angle. It, it burrows straight towards the Poutine. Yes. Yes, at the bottom. The, the, the underground fountain <laughs> of, a... uh, of cheese and gravy. Um, thanks for joining us. <laughs> that, that is the molten core of the planet. That's, that's true. It's what the scientists don't want you to know. It's a deep state plan to hide that the Earth is made out of poutine. And that's why when the asteroid hit the Earth, the moon, which is made out of cheese, exactly. broke off because it's all cheese. Layers wow. of cheese. That, that actually tied together well. You know, I feel like that is actually a very coherent conspiracy theory. Yeah. Well, thank you. I've been practicing. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I've started my own uh, disinformation campaign. <laughs> I should actually be careful of saying that. That could get in me in trouble. From and of course, government. Putin is the way that in Quebec you pronounce Putin, really? the, oh, the right. real overlord. So there's a so, whole other layer to this. So Ukraine is currently being invaded by French fries with cheese and gravy. It is coming from the core of the earth. Yeah. I, I wish that were the case as opposed to the reality, but yeah. Uh, so <laughs> India, you were in India. Yes, I was. I was just in India for the first time since the pandemic. So it's been a long oh, time. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I know one time when we had you on, you had some very enlightening things to say about how India was sort of viewing the invasion of Ukraine, which was more recently. Yeah. When we had you on. I did. Yeah. And going there was very helpful because um, there, there's a, a feeling you get when you're when you're in a country that you can't, you don't get as much if you're just- Like a handful of poutine. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Sort of a squishy, yeah. warm feeling, yeah. delicious feeling of, yeah. Uh, that's exactly what it was like. Um, it, it's been, um, India's been through a lot. I would, last time I was there was November, 2019. And so since then, obviously they had the pandemic, uh, but they also have had, uh, this whole the whole Ukraine thing, which has been a diplomatic issue, but it's also been an inflation issue for food mm. and fuel, and it's also been a diplomatic shock to their system because um, the feeling is, I'm, and I'm I'm just reporting what the feeling is out of I don't you know among the lar large number of people that I had the privilege of speaking with, is that India has been unfairly targeted for um, doing things like. <laughs> buying Russian oil, continuing to buy Russian fossil or fossil fuels because Europe is doing it. Every, a lot of other countries are doing it as well in, in larger amounts. And um, the impression in India is that the targeting, and look at what China's been doing with, with Russia, for example, but China is being presented as part of the solution and India is being presented as the entirety of the other world problem. Um, so... Uh, they still haven't even recovered from Afghanistan, what happened with Afghanistan, with the withdrawal and the leaving behind of the tens of billions of dollars worth of weapons that have gone into the hands of uh, terrorists who are antithetical to India. And the U.S. also left behind biometrics of people who had worked with the U.S. and in some cases worked with India. And the, I mean, the numbers uh, that... I heard from some Indians is it is heartbreaking. And we're talking about over thirty thousand people who were identified and killed via those biometrics for having collaborated or worked with, supported the United States. And these people were killed in India, Afghanistan. In Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Yeah, like door to door. Like they have the database. They know who you are. They have your fingerprints. Your iris scans, whatever. They and go and kill you in front of your family so nobody else does it ever again. So the, I mean, wow. I, yeah, I think the I think there's been a real lack of understanding about how that withdrawal it affects how the rest of the world thinks about operating with the US at that kind of a level on the ground. Well, this is a this very serious issue because, you know, India occupies this very unique space where you know, it has many reasons to be uh, suspicious of China to say the least, but it also doesn't fit in neatly with, you know, the sort of Western world order either um, for reasons like, uh, I wouldn't say allied, but close ties to Russia, but also at the same time, lots of reasons to not be happy with how it's been treated by the Western world. 
Yeah. And so the, the ideas of the Western world, are, they become kind of complicated. <laughs> Uh, so I don't, I don't even, I wouldn't what even. What do you mean? Yeah. So I wouldn't even know how to define it given the actions of the Western world over the last three or four years. If you're looking at it from the point of view of a country like India. So how would you define the Western? Is I mean, is it just geographic? Is it ethnic? Is it moral? How, how would you just, how would you describe the, it now? The West? Yeah. I think of the West as being kind of like. Western Europe plus North America plus Australia, New Zealand, kind of. So it's it's partly geographic, but obviously Australia and New Zealand don't fit in with that. It's partly language, although much of Europe doesn't fit in with that. It's partly values, although obviously there's a, a range of values across that territory anyway. So, so it's, yeah, it's complicated. So if you're in India... And those are the countries you're picking. Right. It's skin color. That, I mean, I'm just saying how that would be perceived. You're, ta you're yeah. talking about countries that historically have been predominant, I mean, in the modern era, you know, col colonies, pre-colonial, pre another issue, but post-colonial are dominantly white. Right. So, yeah. And I, and I, I hesitated because I was going to say Taiwan and Japan as well. Yeah. But I'm not sure... And because in many ways, those two countries are aligned with the West very much in terms of their values, but they're not typically considered part of the West, right? This is this is what India is grappling with also, right? This is So this is, what is this, what's going on? And, um, you know, India and Japan have been getting much closer and India and Taiwan have had a good relationship and it's, I, I think it's quietly getting much closer as well. Um, and I think that there has been concern over the behavior of th this. The other, the other thing is that's also confusing apart from what is the West is what is the United States. So, uh, the state department has a very different attitude towards India than the department of defense does. The, okay. Well, well, can you lay out each of those? The department of defense, um, looks at India and says, these people do share our values and our priorities, which is China and secondarily extremism perfectly. And they're willing to fight. You know, the, in, the, the Indian military is on the border and with China um, and has proven it's willing um, to fight. Yeah. Their soldiers have actually fought Chinese soldiers. They've, they've, killed the PLA soldiers who attacked them and they're ready to do it again. And they want people to know they're ready to do it again because they think that that's, first of all, they are. But second of all, that's how you get people not to do it again. <laughs> to say, you know, we're willing to do this again. So uh, there's a lot of compatibility. And uh, there was an article that came out recently about the U.S. sharing real-time information with India about acti Chinese activities on the border that allowed uh, India to defend itself better. And this is all part of the agreements like BECA that were signed uh, under the previous administration, so it's sort of coming to fruition. Um, so there, there's no real problem between the Department of Defense and the Indian Defense and Security Establishment. State is a whole other universe. Do you know... How long it takes an Indian to get a just a tourist an interview for a tourist visa to come to the U.S.? How long does it take? It currently takes if you're applying in Delhi a little over 500 days. Wow, wow, over a year. Yeah. So if your cousin is getting married, or you want to be there for your daughter's the birth of your grandchild or something like that, good luck. Yeah. yeah. How long does it take somebody in Shanghai? <laughs> How long? About five working days. Why? Why is that the way? So uh, that's what the Indians are asking themselves. Um, one, uh, you know, I write for a newspaper called The Sunday Guardian in India, and they did a front page story uh, saying that reason was very specifically Victoria Newland. They named her and said that she was not happy with India's position on Ukraine and was punishing India for it. There are uh, a lot of other 
reasons that can feed into it, but nobody ever countered that that piece. But was it like that two years ago uh, or, or before COVID? So I'm not sure. I don't think it's ever been this bad. And in fact, at the height, when they wrote the article initially, it was over 800 days. Yeah. So it's gotten better since that article came out. Um, and the excuse that was given by Secretary Blinken was uh, backlog, COVID, understaffed, to which the Indians go, well, look at what's happening with the Chinese visas. They had all the same conditions. So uh, what, I'm, I'm, what I'm just, I'm reporting perception and, uh, and data points and how those data points are perceived. And um, that's the issue with state. You know, they're, they're not super pleased with the new ambassador to India either. Garcetti, who's has had some uh, PR issues. <laughs> you want to say? I'm not going to say anything. Google it. Um, so they're not happy with with him, but they're they're going to take him. But the 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 uh, uh, President Biden insisted on him, held this space open for two years, even though there wasn't a lot of uh, enthusiasm for him until they could get him in. So this is this is a quad country, and they left the seat open in order to get in this guy from the U.S. side. So the the state, the relationship between state and India is very different than the relationship between Department of Defense and India. Mm -hmm.